Good afternoon and welcome to the latest Spaces webinar, Changes to the Building Safety Act. Uh, we're expecting a lot of people today, so I've got a little bit uh, to go through um, before we get to the main presentation to give people a chance to sign on. Uh, okay, so my name is Steve Rufus, I'm Spaces President, and thank you for all joining us today. Um, the webinar is being recorded and it will be uploaded to our YouTube channel in a week or so's time. Uh, and we'll be sending out a follow-up email to you with the YouTube link to, the present or to that presentation. If you have any questions, pre please use the uh, chat bar um, provide, uh, during the presentation and then we'll try and answer these at the end. Also feel free to add any comments or observations during the presentation. Uh, as all things with any technical issues, uh, we found the best way with Webinar Jam, if you aren't getting sound or uh, you've got issues with uh, uh, the, the site, uh, log in on and off again. I know it seems a typical IT one, but it does seem to work. Uh, just a bit back, background on Spaces. Uh, for those of you who are not already Spaces members, um, we're one of the only societies whose membership comprises professionals working across all aspects of the built environment such as architecture, engineering, surveying, construction, design, maintenance, climate change, and sustainability from both the public and private sector. As a society, our objective is to promote best practice through sharing knowledge and experience so that we have excellent public, public sector buildings. So that's the main drive, is to help improve public sector buildings. The society is managed and run by volunteers, so please support us by joining. Uh, if you have a .gov.uk uh, email address, it is free to join. Um, if you work in the private sector, membership starts from as little as £110 per year. Uh, I'll put a link in the chat later on to uh, take you to the link if you do want to join. Over the coming months, uh, we have got one, we've got um, one webinar per month leading up to our National Study Day at the University of Reading on Thursday, 11th of Ju July, 2025, with the theme of retrofit net zero carbon. At the event, we have leading experts presenting in their fields, and it's a fantastic opportunity to network with colleagues doing similar work to yourselves. Uh, we already have two key, key clients uh, represent, uh, presenting, Crawford Wright, Head of DFE Design, and Mark Rutledge from Government Property Agency. So that's uh, all a bit about the front end. Uh, that's given um, enough time for people to join. So back to today's seminar or webinar. Um, Kevin from London uh, is Director of Building Consultancy uh, at uh, Civico. As part of Kevin's role, um, his responsibility for the uh, building control and statutory services for building city, Birmingham City Council. Uh, more recently, alongside with his main role, he's been working with government departments, the building safety regulator, uh, key in industri industry groups, and those developing competency frameworks uh, to influence future standards and regulations and ensure uh, that there is a secure future for the building control professions. So over to Kevin. Um, I must admit we have been having a, a few dropouts as Kevin just <laughs> quickly went and disappeared, but hopefully we'll we'll get through those. So um, on to the uh, on to the presentation, Kevin. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I think obviously the, the software is anticipating that I will just waffle on for too long. Um, I have actually now lost the presentation from the, so if you wanted to start that again so that I can pick it up, that's it. That's great. Okay, we're ready to go. Okay, yep, I've got it back, so that's fine. So we'll go where we go. Right, thank you for uh, joining this afternoon. I'm going to try and run through the obligations that will be placed upon most of us in the construction sector as a result of the Building Safety Act, um, most of which are either actually already in effect or come into effect in three, four weeks' time. Just to paint a little bit of a picture around where I'm working for, a Civico Building Consultancy is an arm's length organization owned by Birmingham City Council. So we provide the building control for Birmingham City Council, um, but we also run a private sector uh, building control business as well. So we've been trading for well over a decade. Um, 
dealing with building control for Birmingham, which as you may be aware, is the largest single local authority in the UK. And as a result, we cover all projects from the smallest domestic alteration right way up to the high risk buildings that are now the focus of everybody's attention. Um, we have some very big key clients, but I'm not going to focus on those for too long, but we clearly deal with a wide range of work, not only within Birmingham, but around the country. So um, to paint a picture of the background of the legislation, obviously most of the changes that we are seeing implemented now into the building regulation regime are as a consequence of the tragic fire at Grenfell Tower and the subsequent reports um, following that, particularly the Building a Safer Future report by Dame Judith Hackett. Um, the Building Safety Act itself has been through the parliamentary process and got royal assent um, nearly two years ago now. And what we've seen since then is a whole raft of secondary legislation and regulations, which are changing the way that we deal with building safety in the construction sector. So we're using the new act, the Building Safety Act, to introduce some new measures, particularly around duty holders. But we're also amending the previous legislation, the, the Building Act 1984, to change some of the practical way in which the system works. What we are seeing in terms of roles and responsibilities is that under the Building Safety Act 2022, the duty holding obligations are very much mirroring the principles of the CDM regulations. But it doesn't necessarily mean that the people with those duties are the same people as under the CDM. It's just following the same format. Okay, so in reality, the Building Safety Act is split into six parts, and particularly part two of that has introduced a new regulator to the sector who are taking the responsibility for the enforcement of building regulations. The building safety regulator is part of the health and safety executive, and they will not only set standards for how building control operates, but they will set guidance on competency for all professionals in the sector, and they will deal directly with higher risk buildings, as we'll see as we, we go through the provisions. And then in terms of the Building Safety Act, there are amendments to the existing legislation and some specific requirements for higher risk buildings. So the, the legislation that we've seen coming through since then have dealt with um, the technical requirements of applying for registrations for high risk buildings, how those will be reviewed by the regulator, also looking at how competencies determined within the sector, which has led to some amendments to architect registration, um, looking at new construction product regulations, and looking at some new rights for um, tenants and occupants of buildings. And perhaps the one at the bottom is the one that doesn't readily spring to mind is what it might be, responsible actors scheme, which is actually to address contractors working in the sector and their willingness to contribute to um, remediation of buildings that may have problems in terms of fire safety. So in terms of the legislation, um, we've had legislation coming forward ever since um, the Act came into effect. These have, as I say, they've introduced the regulator, they've introduced new duties for people involved in the process, and I'll run through those in more detail. There are now new strengthened enforcement powers and sanctions for non-conformance. And then there are additional adu uh, documents required during the construction process. There's a new regime for dealing with high risk buildings and we have a, a series of gateways in the construction which are hard stop points. So um, a high risk building can't, can, progress at planning until there's a suitable fire safety statement and won't be able to progress to site until there's an approval under building regulations. And then again, at the end of the job, won't be occupiable until completion certificates have been issued. So the common misconceptions 
around these changes are that they only apply to high risk buildings, which is quite simply not the case. The vast majority of the proposals and the duty holders obligations that have been introduced apply to every construction project. There's also a concept that the principal designer and principal contractor, because we're using the same terminology as the CDM regulations, there's an assumption that it's the same people involved. But whereas CDM, the, the focus on competencies around health and safety, the principal designer and principal contractor for building safety, the focus is around compliance with the building regulations. There is a, a, a perception that co competency requirements to practice only apply to building control. And that's because building control or having to go through a separate individual registration process in order to be able to continue to practice. But competency requirements apply to everybody throughout the process and particularly duty holders. Um, and again, linked to that, there's a perception that building control and the building safety regulator are responsible for compliance. Whereas actually it is very clear that the people certifying compliance going forward are the client, the designer and the contractor. So the concept that this will all just come in in the same way CDM did and we won't really notice a change is completely flawed in terms of how it will really impact on the sector. So the Act, as I said, is split into a number of provisions and I'm not going to go through lots of detail here because you will be getting a copy of this available through the YouTube channel. So you'll be able to go back and review it as you want to. Um, but it's quite a complicated raft of legislation and you have to see, read through an awful lot of stuff to get to the detail that you're looking for. Um, in addition, there are loads of schedules that go alongside which deal with some things like how the regulations will be implemented, but also look at how his work is being dealt with by what are currently approved inspectors, um, the private sector building control, because all of those are going through a new regime of re-registration to become registered building control approvers. So there has to be a transfer protocol in place. We've also got issues of how remediation is going to be dealt with, and a new home ombudsman scheme as well. Okay, that was really small because I dropped out, but I was back again before it noticed. Hopefully, hopefully you can you're still all with me. Um, secondary legislation has been dropping through. Um, as if it's going out of faction. So there's a huge amount of legislation come through. The majority of the enactment dates were either in October last year or will be on the 6th of April. So most of these elements will come through and all of this is about implementing the provisions within the Building Safety Act. And then we also have amendments to the existing legislation and the existing legislation still remains in place as well. So what we've got is an awful lot more control. In terms of timeline, the legislation and the change has been happening ever since the Building Safety Act got royal assent. Um, and it's been happening now for nearly two years. Um, we've had a lot of the sections of the act come into effect and it's starting to really change the way in which we do the work. Um, so what we've got from April is a scheme that is fundamentally going to drive how the sector works going forward and that scheme will be based largely upon enforcement of regulation. Um, so we had a lot of changes to the sector in October um, preparing us for April and the total change. So the gateways that I was talking about just now in terms of stop points for construction came into force. There's a requirement for a golden thread of information throughout the project so that the people managing the building once it's in occupation can do so safely. And we've now got more powers for the um, product safety regulator alongside the rest of the regime. 
So having said that things don't all focus on higher risk buildings, better just make it clear what a higher risk building is. So a higher risk building is at least 18 meters to the top floor um, or has at least seven stories, slightly different in Wales, has to contain two residential units. So it could be a predominantly commercial building with residential on the top and that would still make it a higher risk building. Could be a high rise care home, high rise hospital. So the definition of height is as it is in the building regulations at the moment. Um, so that determines whether or not it's dealt with by a high risk and by the health and safety executive. And they will be looking at new build, but they will also be requiring registration and review of all existing high risk buildings in England. So this is all about the risk and realistically the reason that 18 meters has been chosen at the moment as the, the limiting factor on higher risk is actually to do with what is within the capability of the sector at the moment in terms of reviewing existing premises and dealing with new and it is fully anticipated that in a few years time once the existing stock has been reviewed these parameters in terms of height may well change and reduce So there are some exclusions in terms of um, what might be residential accommodation that doesn't make it a higher risk building. Um, and th these are things like a hotel or a military barracks. Um, there is also a gray area where if you have, if you're doing work to an existing high risk building, but it doesn't actually affect the residential accommodation, where does that sit within the regime? And this is where a lot of additional guidance and conversations are happening at the moment about how these things might be managed going forward. So if you're unsure, it is always worth checking. But the main focus of the high risk buildings is whether or not there is a sleeping risk in a building that is over 18 meters. So as I say, certain buildings are excluded out um, and I am already conscious that it, it, it's confusing because going down the uh, the list there, a building that comprises entirely of um, the third item day, A2, a hospital, whereas previously we said hospitals and care homes were included. So it does depend exactly how that building is being used. So I talked about the gateways and at gateway one, you will probably already have been asked for fire statements on high rise um, and high risk buildings and potentially all commercial buildings. And this is simply a method of assessing right at the beginning of the project, how the fire safety is going to be addressed. When this provision first came in, and the regulator was looking at high rise buildings going through the early stages of planning, around about 65% of all applications didn't have a suitable fire strategy. Now that's because the industry primarily is not used to developing these things to further in the process. But even so, that was quite disappointing and it has now significantly increased. So gateway two is saying that when we get the um, building control um, submission, it has to be substantially approved in terms of fire, um, building safety matters such as fire and structure before we can actually commence the works on site. And then gateway three, again, requesting a, a certificate for completion of work, but the duty holders, and that's the client, the designer and the contractor all have to confirm that the building meets the building regulation requirements. And what they need to also provide is if they had an approval of the plan, they need to show a change control process as works progressed on site so that that assumption that work is complete is still correct. And occupation is not allowed by the regulator on a high risk building unless they are satisfied that they've received those certificates and they've done their own completion certificate. 
and they have currently advised that that process could take 12 weeks from when the building is practically complete. So as I said, Gateway 1, that's been um, with us for quite a long while now. It is a fairly basic statement of fire safety, but it does at least have to show it's been considered and what's been considered. And obviously it is more complicated for complex buildings where standard off the shelf guidance isn't necessarily being followed to demonstrate a route to compliance. Gateway two, very much for the high risk building, we are now looking at a similar situation to Scotland where you do not start on site until such time as you have an approval in place. Um, and at that stage, principal designers and principal contractors will need to be appointed. And those of you who are currently working with schemes going through the building regulation process will have noticed that the application forms have changed to ask for details of the principal contractor and the principal designer as part of the application. Similarly, there's more information there in terms of the type of information that we expect to see at building regulation application stage, but primarily that hasn't really changed other than a statement to say that the applicant believes the work complies. Um, and yeah, I'll skip through some of these. So there's, there's a competency declaration. It needs a signed declaration at that stage from the client or someone working on their behalf to say that they are content that the principal designer and principal contractor have the competence to discharge their duties effectively. Um, and that must show how they've assessed the competence of those individuals. So we're expecting clients to be doing a bit more due diligence about the competence of the people they're engaging to do the work for them. Um, so the, yes, there's that signed declaration and there is the potential for the building safety regulator or the building control body to challenge that if they do not believe people are competent to do the work that they've been appointed for. And then as I say, on high risk buildings at preoccupation, we will be looking for a sign off from the duty holders that they believe the building complies before the regulator will um, issue any completion certificate. And that same process will mirror for every commercial project. So the, the building control dealing with the project will expect the designer, the contractor and the client to say, certify that they believe it complies before they will come out and do their completion inspection. So what are we looking at in terms of competence? Well, generally duty holders, and this is wider than high risk buildings, um, have to be able to demonstrate that they have the correct level of competence to deal with the work involved. Once they've been appointed and they have that level of competence, their duties very much mirror what we've seen in CDM regulations. So there's a, a duty um, to cooperate and share information, ensure compliance with the building regulations, um, comply with the regulatory um, regime such as gateway points, and ensure that the people that they appoint are competent. Um, now, some of this is going to have some fairly major knock on because the issue of starting work once you've got the design signed off may change the timing of appointments of some consultants within this process. OK, so we are looking towards an industry competence um, and competence now is being considered as skills, knowledge, experience and quite importantly, the behaviours of the individual involved. Um, so they have to show that they've got the capability to perform the function in respect of building regulation compliance. That could be a company or an organization, but they then have to show they've got somebody within that structure who has that level of competence. Okay. In terms of the duty holders then, um, the building owner um, or accountable person as a duty holder in terms of the building in occupation and in use. 
that may not be necessarily the the accountable person may not be the same person as the building owner and may not be the same person as the client but generally the accountable person will be the building owner the client is considered to be the person commissioning the work we then have a principal designer coordinating the design and a principal contractor coordinating the construction and then other designers and contractors so for some of those roles um, there are publicly available specifications that detail how competence could be demonstrated and this is where people are now having to provide this level of information to the client so that the client is satisfied so in general terms in terms of who is responsible within the whole process um, we can see from this that the the client has to check the competence of the people they are directly appointing and those people have to check the competence of anybody who's appointed as a, a, a sub designer subcontractor and designers and contractors cannot start work until they are happy that the client has appointed a principal designer or a principal contractor within all of this the role of building control has shifted ever so slightly um, in that um, going forward they will basically be watching this process they will not necessarily be considered to be taking some of the responsibility that they have been in the past um, so it's a slightly different role particularly when it comes to things like giving advice to the design team so duty holder competence in terms of what we're looking at as i said skills knowledge experience and behavior um, can be an organization but very much within all of this framework of how it's demonstrated and how it's written to legislation if you are familiar with cdm it is mirroring cdm but there is no implication that these are the same people that are doing the same the same job titles under cdm so most of it is all about planning and managing and monitoring work, cooperating with others and sharing information. Okay, and then the client clearly has the obligation to be appointing the right people. Okay, and the, then the principal designer, principal contractor should be advising the client on their obligations. So I'm not going to go through in a lot of detail, but the designer, the principal designer, it, it is all about working within a level of competence, planning the work effectively, um, sharing information, and then ultimately at the end of the job, certifying that it complies. Okay, very much the same there with the principal designers. and the contractors is very similar but obviously dealing with the construction phase phase of the works and similarly with the principal contractor so there are some additional duties on people for higher risk buildings um, so apart from the fact that you would have to demonstrate that you're competent to work on those buildings um, there has to be a a chain of evidence to show how competence was actually established um, the principal designer principal contractor have to be appointed before the building control application is um, submitted and we have to have these um, compliance notices issued so there are some offenses that break um, that are newly created that will come into effect if some of these steps are not taken as part of the process so as i say we need duty holder jet declarations at approval stage um, <clears throat> in terms of competence and at the end of the job we need the client to sign that the work is in full compliance and that full compliance declaration will not be reliant on the building control inspection it will be reliant on information from the designers and the contractors 
Similarly, the designer and the contractor, or the principal designer and principal contractor, have to give their own declaration of conformity at the end of the project. So, um, I mentioned earlier on that there are some new powers that come with this legislation uh, and some new penalties. So the first new power in terms of building regulations is the ability to serve a compliance notice or a contravention notice during the work, which then means that people have to um, put that element of the work correct within a given period of time. Alongside that, there is the ability to serve a stop notice for a serious, serious building regulation breach where all work will stop until such time as that item is rectified. Um, there's some additional information in relation to liability, but there are some additional offences, particularly about giving information to the regulator, um, which can lead to um, unlimited fines and imprisonment. Um, the one that I find somewhat strange being in a building control background is that there is now a, a criminal offence of impersing a building. Right, I'm hoping you're still with me because everything went black of impersonating a building control inspector. Um, so that again is a criminal conviction. There's also a criminal offence of um, a building inspector carrying out work without outside their scope of registration. So building control is a little bit unique in that you have to be registered um, to demonstrate competence and that restricts the type of building that you can work on. And as a consequence, um, if you work beyond that scope, again, that is a potential criminal offence. Um, otherwise, some of the existing powers remain in effect, but what is worth noting is that Section 36 of the current Building Act Defective Premises Act, sorry, um, some of the timescales have changed significantly in terms of the period in which uh, prosecutions can be taken, and therefore liability remains for a longer period than perhaps we've seen before. before. One of the key issues that came out of the Dame Judith Hackett report was this golden thread of information, because not only does the building have to be designed and constructed to meet the regulations, it has to be manageable and it has to be safe to live in. So as a consequence, there's this requirement for a thread of information all the way through the construction process, through to the occupation and management process. All higher risk buildings have to be registered and their fire safety will be reviewed. And the only way that the um, appropriate persons can actually manage those premises is if they've got access to the right information. So there's this absolute need to track information all the way through the process, including that change control process, to ensure that those using the building have the right information. So the principle of the golden thread is that we've got a trusted resource of information that is accurate, that people can actually interpret and understand relatively easily, and will live with that building throughout its life so that it develops as we go through. Um, so what it really means is, in very basic terms, the building, building regulation application becomes part of this to show how the regulations were met and how the building conformed to the design so that there are ways of understanding what was done. One of the problems we have with buildings at the moment is if something changes during the design or there is a, a valid reason for offsetting one item against another. It's not necessarily carried into the history of the building. So we need that continuity of information as we go forward. And then clearly, as you would expect, you get all your relative certificates. That's the 
confirmation certificates from the design contractor client, the building regulation completion certificate, but also the commissioning and test certificates that go with the building as it works its way through. Um, so all of that information, all of the relevant drawings and plans, um, any of the change control process has to be part of this final pack of information. And the critical bit here is that it has to be in a format that the people managing the building can actually use and interpret. So if we are using something such as BIM, we have to make sure that the end user has an access point where they can actually get into it, understand it, and interpret what they're seeing. Okay, so again, the duty holders must make sure that those risks have been assessed in the design and construction process and are then passed on to the people actually managing. So it needs that engagement. And then once we're into the management phase, the person managing the building needs an engagement process with the residents. There has to be a feedback loop to address any issues that are being raised. Okay. And yes, as with everything else, the, the principal designer, principal contract have a duty to share and, and contribute to this information. And once the building is ready for occupation, then what goes together is a safety case report. Now this is being done at the moment for all of the existing high rise buildings in the country, but the golden thread of information and the design philosophy will form the basis of this for all new projects going forward. Um, and that will then be assessed by a separate team at the building safety regulator who are reviewing the safety of all existing buildings. Okay, so the golden thread, it, it does provide that information and that framework. But what it isn't, it isn't a single, this is how it works for every building, and I can just replicate this. It's not like a, a generic fire risk assessment, if you like. We do end up to have something that is bespoke to the building we're talking about. Right, in terms of management of um, high risk buildings, we've got these new accountable persons or principal accountable persons who will have the duties put on them. Um, they should already six months ago have, regulate, have registered the building with the regulator and be carrying out and producing this safety case at the moment. They'll be compiling as far as they can, as much of the information to go with the building. And they will then have to um, provide the information to apply for a building assessment assistant to give it from the regulator. Um, the idea is then that that will then um, look at the safety and to a certain extent certifying an existing building. Um, but there will need to be within that a means of reporting any incidents or problems in terms of building safety and a mechanism for residents to engage in that process. So realistically, um, the bit, the building details, as you would expect, the address, the height, number of residential units have to be part of that registration. And there will be a new national register of these buildings that will be searchable in the same way that there will be a national register of competent building inspectors to carry out the building control function. Okay, and then once you get anything that changes the management or anything fundamental in respect to the building, there has to be a revised safety case put forward um, so that we can assess or the regulator can assess any change to the potential risk. Clearly, part of the, the issue that came out of the Grenfell inquiry was this need for a resident's voice so that people who had concerns have a mechanism for making that known and taking it forward. It's always going to be difficult for those managing buildings, the accountable person, because a lot of the um, residents won't necessarily have a detailed knowledge or understanding of fire safety or structural safety issues. Um, but this process still has to be entered into 
and people have to have um, their concerns addressed. In the same way, residents will be under an obligation not to create a, a risk of fire or structural failure and not to interfere with a, fire, a relevant safety item. And I think a clear example of this has been in the past that fire safety for high rise buildings is very much focused on the common parts of the buildings, the corridors, the staircases, the lifts, the ventilation systems. Um, this obligation extends that fire safety analysis beyond that flat entrance door. So in the past, if somebody had chosen to park their motorbike in their flat hallway, or steal, um, store tins of paint or fuel, um, that wasn't really addressable. Whereas now, obviously, there is the potential that what somebody does within their own residence may significantly affect the risk of fire in the building. So that has to be taken into account as well. And part of this process is to apply for the building assessment certificate so that as it goes forward, the principal appoint accountable person can show that every step's been taken to make the building as safe as they possibly can. There is the potential in applying for a building assessment certificate that some buildings may become blighted if it's just not possible to bring something up to a reasonable standard. But those sort of issues are being addressed through a potential levy to deal with remediation. So um, to summarize before we drop to, to uh, questions, um, we, the, there's a huge focus on competence in the sector. As I've said, mentioned briefly a couple of times, building control are going through a registration process to demonstrate competence. There is the potential that that is being done at building control because Building control is a relatively small profession, so it's quite a good place to start if you're going to trial a regime. And there is the potential that other professions will follow a similar path in the future. Um, it is quite um, clear that communication and collaboration are critical throughout this process, and so is record keeping and particularly change control during the construction process. But all of this is to underline compliance with the building regulations. So it is about achieving compliance. And I did briefly mention earlier on that part of the role of building control is changing. Under the new code of conduct that registration brings with it for building control practitioners, we are not allowed to provide design advice. We can provide advice on where to find design guidance and where to find appropriate solutions, but we cannot advise on a specific design solution. And that is a very significant change in terms of the build control function. So, um, I'm going to try now and address some of the questions, if that's OK. OK, Kevin, thank you for that. Um, again, just looking at that, there's a, there's a few come up on those. Uh, can you see them in the chat or shall I run yeah. through them? No, I can, I can pick them up from the yep. chat, okay. if that's OK. I've got a few as well. <laughs> but... Right. Um, now, I'm assuming that the, the ones at the top of the first question. Yes, in, correct. That's, that's the way I'm going to treat it. Um, so refurbishment of an HRB where the scope of works does not require planning, then it would clearly still wouldn't, it would not go through gateway one as part of the planning process, but it will be an application to the new regulator rather than a local authority building control or an approved inspector. So it would still be being dealt with by the new regulator. All of those such applications, there's an application portal on the Gov um, .gov website. Um, so applications there go to the regulator. Um, the regulator itself hasn't got hundreds of building control practitioners. 
so they will be farming this work out to building control providers with the correct skill sets um, but it will still have to go through that process it just won't go through um, gateway one at planning but it will go through the building regulation process in the same way it always has it's just the application will go to the regulator rather than the local authority or an approved inspector um, right greg do planning permitted development rights affect this process no is the simple answer to that one um, this at the moment is totally divorced from planning there is an element that's at attached to these regulations which is going to introduce a building safety levy which we charge on people doing residential development and that charge will be used for remediation of existing clad buildings but at the moment it's not determined whether that is being collected through planning or through building regulations but that will apply to the creation of new residential units so it will get picked up in the process anyway um, right so yes we're recording that's good uh, and just thinking on that kevin there's a couple of questions there coming through which is so it's really the last one is going through where it's talking about you know with the high-risk buildings there's quite a lot of documentation going in through those you know, of what's required for those but for my understanding is that a lot of the procedures and ways forward are required for any building control application going through with before you know, it's whether there's any anything can be clarification on that or a little bit more guidance on yeah. that um yeah, I did mention briefly at the beginning that mm. although this legislation is driving a high rise, it does mm. catch everything. Mm. Um, so a lot of the the information that we've talked about in terms of certifying and signing off work, mm -hmm. the information that's required during the process, they apply to everything. Obviously, when you get down to domestic alteration work, the interpretation of who's designers, contractors and the client is is slightly different but in theory things apply to everything now there is a question here about the small scale scale works like replacement windows boilers that would be under a competent person scheme does it apply to those and i can only actually say that i know of at least one instance now for replacement windows on a high rise which has gone to the regulator to deal with um, but generally the smaller works the competent person schemes, they're not really affected but we're, because we're already saying they're being dealt with by somebody who's competent. But otherwise, yes, the majority of this applies across the board. And you will see building control bodies asking for different information on their application forms mm -hmm. and for more information on completion. Okay. Thank you, Kevin, on that bit. So, um, can I show you an example of a change control log? No, this <laughs> is a simple answer from that. Um, the change control logs, there's no defined format, um, but it will be something that primarily the principal contractors will be working up to record all those changes from the design philosophy mm -hmm. um, as works progress. And the most, the most difficult thing to keep track of is the substitution of materials. Um, and that's that's the that's that's where the focus really is in change control because it was the substitution of materials during the Grenfell that, that caused part of the problem. And I presume that will be on all types of project, Kevin. You know, so the change control, even on a smaller, when I say smaller scale, small commercial project, if it's a, it's not it's it's not high high rise building, high risk. Yeah. But you still need to can have that documentation trail. You will still need to have that all across the board yes mm -hmm. because ultimately that's where the system has fallen down in the past mm -hmm. um, so yeah definitely thank you um so completion certificate required for all projects are only high risk no that that um statement of completion from the principal designer contractor and client is going to be required i would say in practice on all commercial jobs um, but again, it might be that, that people are looking for it across the board because it makes perfect sense. Um, some, there's a question here about is there any guidance um, recommended, particularly for non high risk buildings? Um, it is quite a disappointing element of this huge raft of legislation that's coming through. 
that the new building safety regulator do not really see part of their role being providing guidance. So they're leaving it very much for the industry to come up with a lead on how we demonstrate and what is a suitable piece of guidance. This is, this is obviously part of the significant shift because up until now, the responsibility has always let, sat with the um, Department for Leveling Up Housing Communities within government. Having moved it to the regulator, there is this sort of limbo situation at the moment, but there is, as I understand it, no great intent to publish new guidance. Um, right, how does the gateway process relate to the REBA stages? Um, it doesn't mesh. A lot of this stuff doesn't mesh properly. You can sort of say that, that the building regulation stage is sort of three, four, um, but in reality, it's not been designed necessarily to mesh exactly with that. What it's been designed to look at is where the, the touch points are with the regulatory group. And part of the part of the issues about where those touch points might be and the design stages, some of the questions that are typically being thrown about is this all sounds great in theory, but how does it work in terms of things like design and build? And how does it work where you've got a, an original design team and then it's novated for the detail later on? And some of these things we are only going to get to grips with as we move forward and use it. And given previous examples from the new regulators point of view what we will probably see driving it is some test cases to set precedent so um in cdm you get some default um carrying out of the principal design principal contractor if nobody's actually appointed um within the building regulations there will be a need to name a person on a commercial job on a domestic project, it may well all end up being the client. It really comes down to who is doing what role. So, you know, quite often on a smaller domestic job, the designer is actually the contractor because they're the designing it as they go along. Okay. So, um, yeah, is it anticipated there'll be two principal designers and maybe two principal contractors, one for CDM and one for building safety the the simple answer to that is yes there could well be two because the principal designer for cdm has to have competence in health and safety and the principal designer for um, building safety has to have competence in building regulations so if you happen to have somebody who's got that level of competence or you've got an organization that's got individuals within it that have those competencies then it could be one person or one entity but it's far more likely to be separate people because it's different skill sets um in terms of information in wales it is a slightly different situation and i haven't focused on that in this presentation because wales isn't working with the regulator in the same way um, so it's a slightly different format. They are still looking um, for defined roles, but they're not working with the regulator in the same way. Okay. So Kevin, um, from my point of view, the the uh, when I I lost connection for a while and it's lost the chat, so I, oh, okay. I can't see the questions <laughs> at the moment. Just nothing. I'm just putting a little poll up that if people want to answer, it's not. I'll just put it up there. It's not uh, obligatory, but it's just useful feedback for us the future so kevin i'll let you <laughs> continue that's fine i don't i don't think um there's not too much more there there's a question they're saying would something like um modernization and refurbishment of a lift in an hrb come under the regulator um i think the answer to that is you'd have to ask the regulator it, it quite possibly could um and do all products need to be identified at gateway stage two so if you like building regulation application there would be en enough of a specification to show compliance with fire safety and structural safety um, obviously if those products then change during construction that's part of the change control but yes we would expect to see that level of inference at that stage and that does significantly change how some of the design process works because 
quite often the appointment of specialist subcontractors um, dealing thing with things like smoke ventilation, um, suppression systems and the like. They're not necessarily on board that early in the process. Um, so it is going to change how we work or we're going to see some very broad statements on applications that say about compliance that enables a tick in the box and the detail of the later stage. Okay, I think, I hope, hang on. What is my um, understanding of the role of the designated individual? Um, as with everything, there's a lot of terminology that's coming out of some of this legislation that isn't clearly defined. Um, so I'm, I'm at the moment going to hold back from giving an opinion on that. Okay, I think that's covered most of it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's all right. Um, yep. As you say, you've got your poll running now, haven't you? Yep, that's okay. Just finished that. But okay, that's that's brilliant. And um, what I say, Kevin, thank you for that uh, run through. And again, it's one of those things. I don't think the industry has really quite got the hang or the hold of this, the, the implication of it in its total. Uh, it's, we're going through the high, high risk buildings. Yes, people all understand that, but it's how it impacts on on other type of buildings of every type and the uh, how it's going to affect um, um, time scales, etc. I think the industry is still getting the head around of that, but uh, I'm sure there will be many other discussions and uh, presentations on this as it goes through. But thank you for giving the over overview. That's really been appreciated for yourself and support from Civico for two spaces. So um, thank you all very much for attending and uh, look out for the emails that will come through so we can get the links to the um, to the uh, recording, etc. Again, thank you very much for everybody who attended and uh, goodbye.